All right, well, uh, thank you everybody for being here this morning. Uh, I am uh, Brian Clark from the Hudson Institute, uh, and I want to thank you, the, thanks to the Navy League to, for uh, putting on uh, a great uh, conference this year uh, with a terrific turnout. So uh, we appreciate all your guys' support for the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard and all that they do. Uh, with us today, uh, we're going to have our uh, congressional panel, and uh, we're really uh, you know, we're greatly privileged to have a, a group of uh, HASC members that are here that are taking time away from uh, a lot of activity over on the Hill to spend some time with us and talk about the, the future of the Naval Services. Uh, so to my uh, left, we have uh, Congressman Rob Whitman from Virginia, Thanks, uh, Congressman Joe Courtney from Connecticut, Congressman Donald Norcross from New Jersey, Congresswoman Jen Kiggins from Virginia, and uh, Congressman Ronnie Jackson from Texas. Yeah. So let me, uh, let's give them a, a round warm applause for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. So there's, a, there's obviously a lot of news uh, going on about the Naval Services right now. We had just the budget come out uh, last month, or I guess about a month and a half ago. Um, the Navy recently released a 45 day review of their shipbuilding programs. Uh, which highlighted some uh, delays amongst some of the most prominent shipbuilding programs the Navy is pursuing. And, and certainly we've got uh, military operations happening in the Middle East uh, and in Ukraine uh, and a lot of activity out in the South China Sea with regard to China. So it's a very active time for the Naval Services right now. They're doing a lot of good work. Um, we heard from Admiral Cottle about some of the terrific uh, activity that's happening out there and the fact that it needs to be supported with uh, resources uh, and with uh, concept development back here in the States. So let's talk a little bit about that with our uh, panel members today. So I want to open it up by asking you um, all to talk a little bit about you know the recent budget that got released uh, from the Department of Defense and some of the ideas that are in there. Uh, in particular, you know the, the budget tends to kind of increase the investment in innovation and technology and look at that as a way to regain a military advantage versus opponents like China and Russia. Um, and then maybe reduces some of the investment in procurement and force structure that may have been necessary to get the capacity and need to ha have a ready force and have a globally deployed force. Um, are those the right set of priorities? And do we need to maybe think of reshuffling that given the, the stress that, that the services are under today uh, and the challenges facing them around the world? So uh, Congressman Whitten, let's start with you. Sure, well, Brian, it, listen, it's great to invest in RDT&E, but at some point you have to field systems. And I would argue with the 2027 timeframe being our metric that you have to be able to, to take action. You have to be able to execute. Listen, things like replicator, things that we're doing to really have the full suite of, of capability that we need. We need uh, expendables, we need attritables, we need exquisite platforms, but we have to be able to do that at the speed of relevance. You can't say we're gonna keep doing RDT&E and then never get to a point where we actually feel those systems. And you also have to make sure too that as we look at kind of the game that takes place back and forth, and it happens with all administrations, is the president's budget comes over and it takes out you know, critically important platforms like Virginia class submarine, which we know we have that significant advantage under the sea. And now we're gonna go back to one in the face of the AUKUS agreement, and the Australians go, what the? Anyway, what, what we have to do is to make sure that we are combing the budget and look at what are the ads, because some of those ads that have happened over the past two years are gonna to have to be the pay for for things that we absolutely need. And what, what has happened is, as the top line has increased, the game has become, we'll add a bunch of the stuff that we know Congress won't add, and we'll take out stuff that we know Congress right. is going to right. put, put back in, and that will be a, a, a net gain. Yeah. That game has to stop. I mean, we have to say, no, that's not going to be a net gain. We have to make sure that we are holding the line, that we are getting the most out of our dollars, that we are putting equal emphasis on fielding systems, fielding capability and capacity, right. as well as doing that groundbreaking research. I argue there's a lot of great development that's gone on out there that today, if we could just operationalize, especially in the realm of expendables and attritables, and we need those platforms now to create mass and to create deterrence on China. We can't wait, you know, a decade or so. And here's the thing that concerns me too, you know, the, 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 the future year defense plan, the fight up, you know, all of our dreams always come true outside the fight up. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna build the greatest Navy the world's ever known outside the fight up. That's gotta stop. You know, we have to look at how do we create that mass and capability and capacity <clears throat> as quickly as possible. Right, right. Congressman Courtney. Sure, uh, <clears throat> I agree with a lot uh, what Rob said. Um, you know, to me, the, the, this really is a false choice. I mean, I think we can walk 
and chew gum at yeah. the same time. And there's just no question that there's things happening in the Ukraine uh, conflict has really demonstrated the fact that innovation um, is really important right now in terms of just, you know, lessons learned. Uh, but, you know, if you step back and you zoom out from this budget, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, you know, it's tight. It, it only allows a 1% increase in DOD's budget. But if you then go down a little deeper and look at shipbuilding, which took a 3.7% cut from the appropriated level that we just passed, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, um, you know, that, that math really kind yeah. of is questionable. Yeah. Right. And, and um, in December, uh, Undersecretary LaPlante issued his defense industrial mm -hmm. report, which kudos to him. I mean, that's such an important thing for the Department of Defense to really prioritize, but um, procurement stability was the watchword throughout that report, and, and we're sacrificing that, I mean, literally within weeks <laughs> at, with this budget <laughs> that came out after um, uh, LaPlante's report. So, um, you know, Rob and I and, and others here, I mean, we, we've been through lots of budgets in the past. We're not a rubber stamp. We're in the process of really uh, drilling down on this, and, and I think, you know, you, you've heard already the fact that, you know, we, we know what we're going to be looking at as we get closer to markup. Right, right. Yeah, Congressman Norcross. First of all, thank you for the invitation to my colleagues for being here. Uh, the one thing I like to begin by saying is we work really well together. We will have differences, which we should in democracy, but I think HASC is a great way to really illustrate how we can work together in an important time. So thank you for the question. I think in any question that comes up concerning budget, you have to start out with saying it needs to be on time and no more CRs because the most damaging item that we can do is a CR, CR, CR. And I think everybody up here certainly understands that. Given the threats that we're dealing with, and I was in the Philippines and Taiwan last week uh, hearing firsthand some of those challenges, much of which we can't talk about here, but we understand, as Rob said, that 27 time frame is incredibly important. But any administration, as they put out their budget, it's where their priorities are at that moment with two asterisks next to it, because they fully understand the complexities and also the nuances it takes to get a budget done. Rob talked about exactly what do we plus up so they don't have to. So the idea of a starting point is understandable, and that's when we're here to do our job each and every day. Thanks. Uh, Representative Kiggins. Yeah, I just want to echo what uh, my colleague Congressman Norcross said about Hask being very bipartisan from the other side of the aisle, especially I'm always turning around and looking at agreeing 100% uh, with, with what all of my colleagues are saying. So, so that's refreshing uh, to me and should be to all of us. I think Congress and whoever's in the White House needs to start putting their money where their mouth is. We know that the world is not a safe place right now. We see what's going on between Israel and South China Sea and Russia and Ukraine and <laughs> And we need to make sure that our Navy is reflective of the fight that we're in right now. I just returned from a week in Israel and listening to Israelis talk about the importance of having those two aircraft carrier off the coast and how meaningful that was and what a deterrent that was for Hezbollah and their fight in the north and just preventing uh, any, any escalation up in the north. So it just reminded me and should remind all of us that we need to be taking care of our Navy. I, I, uh, share the concerns of, of Mr. Norcross just with the continu continued resolutions. I was frustrated as a person who represents Hampton Roads, which is a very Navy district, uh, and us keep kicking that can down the road and passing continuing resolutions multiple times. We know that that impacts the technology development research capabilities of our defense industrial base. So being able to provide them stability in the form of a budget that we can get passed in a timely manner is important, and it's certainly a priority for me and should be for all of Congress. So there's still work to do, uh, but we certainly have, have a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Congressman Jackson. Uh, I love it how you, uh, these in these panels, it's always the most junior guy with the least amount of experience <laughs> at the very end who has to follow everybody else you know, uh, when all the great talking points have already been taken. But no, I, uh, I agree, you know, I think that, uh, uh, it, it's going to be impossible for us. We've, I, I've already figured that, this out on my short time in Congress on, on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, it's going to be impossible to compete with China when it comes to quantity, right? We know we can't do that. Uh, they rely on, you know, more is better. I've heard uh, uh, Congressman Whitman say this uh, numerous times, uh, you know, that uh, a quantity has a quality all of its own at some point, and I think that that's kind of the way they operate. But we, we can't do that, especially with the budget constraints that we have uh, and uh, some of the other uh, the issues we have, we have trouble uh, with regards to uh, our equipment, our ships, uh, 
uh, even our personnel, right? I mean, it, whether it's uh, the defense industrial base and the capacity issues we have, uh, or it's, uh, you know, uh, it's the bureaucracy of the government that surrounds all that and makes it more difficult. Uh, with regards to personnel, it's our recruitment and retention issues that we're having right now. It's difficult for us to, uh, to compete uh, in a variety of levels. So I think that we have to rely on innovation and research and development uh, to get that competitive edge back, because we're not gonna do it with numbers. Uh, those days are, are gone. Uh, I think things like uh, Congressman uh, Whitman re referenced the replicator program, things of that nature I think are good. I was just recently out in the Hampton Roads area uh, and I was at the shipyards there at the, at the Newport News uh, shipbuilding. Uh, I was at NASCO, I've been out to some of the other shipyards, Austell and, uh, and some of those. And, and I, I see the challenges that they have right now. And so I think that uh, we, have, we have to speed things up when it comes to innovation uh, you know, and uh, things of that nature, it's even important to be even faster because, you know, technology, obviously, uh, it's, it's a very short period of time before uh, today's technology is irrelevant. Uh, and if we can't come up with a process uh, on the procurement side that allows these things to move faster uh, and, and get them to the, you know, to the warfighter sooner, uh, we're, we're not going to win that fight. Uh, we're, we know we're going to lose it from a, uh, from a quantity standpoint. We have to win it uh, from an innovation standpoint. Thanks, Congressman Jackson. So um, I wanted to remind everybody that we have uh, a QR code that you can use to um, enter questions in and send questions up to this iPad here that I'm using. So I can take questions from the audience as we get later into the program. So please uh, take advantage of that and send me in questions that you'd like to direct to a particular representative or, or to the group in general. Um, and thanks for that. Uh, so you know, one to follow up on that, you know, the idea of workforce and uh, recruiting and retention that uh, Congressman Jackson brought up. So, uh, Representative Kiggins, you know, you're you're a naval aviator or a former naval aviator, um, and you've lived this uh, dream of you know having to you know, manage people and bring people into the service and keep them on uh, in the service. Um, the the Navy clearly is having a challenge there, having uh, missed its recruiting goals by about 20% last year. Uh, the Marines met their goal, um, but it's been challenging. I think retention, you know, is okay, but you know, has continued to require more investment. Um, how is the how should the Navy how, how does how should the Navy navigate that challenge, and also how can Congress help in terms of improving the recruiting environment? Yeah, so I had the honor of sitting on a recruitment retention quality of life task force that we had from Armed Services Committee. Uh, it was a bipartisan group, and we worked for about eight months, hearing from all all walks of life across the service branches, from senior enlisted leadership to senior officer leadership to just family advocacy organizations, and asking, you know, what do they need? How how good of a job are we doing, and what can we do better? And and there were several takeaways, but always number one was pay and compensation. That was by far and away the biggest area for improvement uh, when we think about recruit recruitment and retention. Uh, that 5.2% pay raise that we just gave our servicemen and women in the appropriations bills that were passed a couple weeks ago, that's a good starting place, but there's still more work to do. I would say after that was housing was really a, our second area of improvement. And gosh, I could spend probably hours and, and all of us <laughs> on this panel could just talking about the, the condition of housing that we've seen. Uh, family housing, we, we've come a long way. We've privatized a lot of that. We, we've done some good things, but unaccompanied housing specifically, so much more work to do. It's it's frustrating to walk into the barracks of where we put, especially our, our junior enlisted people, and and thinking of of where we ask them to live. And you know, I've got four kids. Three have been in college recently. We've done a lot of college tours. Thinking of the dormitories that that are offered on college campuses and and how those kids live compared to the kids who are living same age, you know, on our military bases and the jobs that we have both of those groups of young people doing. We have to do better for our junior junior soldiers, sailors, and airmen and Marines to be able to expect them to want to, to do the job that we ask. So, and then after housing, I would say childcare was, was a big issue. We have a lot of, a lot more women serving now. We have a lot of dual military couples out there. So childcare is, is hard no matter where you are and what, what job you're doing. Uh, again, as a working mom of four, I very much understand that issue. Uh, but we're gonna focus on that for the military on our bases. How can we recruit, retain the staff we need, making sure we're compensating there as well. Spousal employment is always a, a big issue that we talk about for civilian spouses uh, who move from state to state frequently. So there, there is work to do. I think over, overlying and an overarching message too is just, just the, uh, the message of patriotism and serving the country. You know, our country is awesome, period, hands down. There's no better military in the world. So we need to make sure that that message is communicated to our young people. I worry about the messages they get because they get a lot of them. Again, I've got, I've got four teenagers in my house and looking at you know, what's on their phones and what goes, goes into their head and, 
And they need to be reminded how great America is, but what made America great in the first place and, and what an honor it is to serve our great nation. So I think if we can get back to that, just, uh, just instilling that patriotism uh, in our young people, I think that'll go a long way as well. Congressman Whitman. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to add the, the place that we really need to focus on. And listen, this 5%, 5.2% increase this year was great. But remember, the lower you are on the salary scale, the percentage yeah. is not as quite as much in your paycheck. <laughs> Take, for example, if, you're, if you come into our services, if you are a private in the Army, the Marine Corps, uh, third-class seaman, third-class airman, your starting salary is $23,000 a year. That's $11.50 an hour asking you to do the most dangerous work of the nation, putting your life on the line, and guess what? You can go to Chick-fil-A and serve chicken sandwiches and make more money in a much, much less challenging or dangerous environment. We have got to fix the junior enlisted salary differential. 5% is great, 5% is great if you're, if you're in the officer corps, but if you're there, that's $1,100. So, so now you're going from $23,000 or $23, a year to $24,000 a year, roughly. We have got to do better. The big jump that we need to make next year, and I know our appropriators have started down that path, is we have to close the gap on junior enlisted salaries. Right. It, it, one, uh, another you know, area um, you know, of workforce challenges, uh, Congressman Norcross, is, is industrial base and, and workforce mm -hmm. in the industrial base. Um, there's, they're having the same difficult, difficulties, right? Their pay is, is probably not comparable to what's available out in the commercial sphere. Um, and they're having difficulty recruiting and retaining people to work in shipyards or in manufacturing facilities. What, what are some of the you know, ways that the government can try to improve the ability of industry to hire and retain workers that we need for these new systems? So government certainly plays a role in it, but I think uh, that's simplistic. We have to go well beyond that. Over the past uh, half dozen years, we came through a pandemic and when I bring that up, those who were going to school on Zoom, sitting at home, finding out that they could, quote, survive through Zoom, and now they are our next workforce. Uh, challenging because we're in a competition. And I think there's three basic elements to looking at this problem of our industrial base, setting aside the complexity of the supply chain, but looking more at the human capital and what it takes, because it is the longest lead item of what we have. And number one, it starts at home. In our country, good, better, and different, the narrative for most kids is you have to go to college to make it. Well, that might be some. I certainly want my doctor to have a little bit of college. We might even need a few lawyers out there. But the idea that we value college above all other, I think, is a misnomer. I was on my way to a commissioning uh, and sat next to a teacher, and we just started chatting about this. And she said to me that, you know, her kids are going through this right now. We have to give our children permission to pursue areas that are of interest to them. You know, I'm one of four boys. My three brothers went to college. I did an apprenticeship. Our society looks at those who toil with their hands, and Rob and I have had countless discussions on this, is somewhat less than those that go to college. We immediately create stigma for those who work with their hands. But the fact of the matter is, you might have the greatest engineers in the world, but if you can't build it, it doesn't count. So A, starts with the family, certainly goes on to school, those guidance counselors to say, there is dignity in all work. And we have to value that, <clears throat> excuse me, because that's incredibly important. But at the end of the day, it's the employers who will go out and recruit. So giving that standing to those who work with their hands, the classic story is I have three kids. One's a doctor, one's a lawyer, and one's an electrician. <laughs> There's only one of them that has his house paid for, no college <laughs> debt, and has a retirement fund that we will all be jealous of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't take a genius, but we as a country have to give value across the board and it starts right at home. Right. So I'd like to give a, a little bit more of an encouraging yeah. picture, which is last year, um, the CEO of Electric Boat announced a hiring target of 5,750 people, which people thought he was like out of his mind when he said that. That's a bigger number than the yard recruited during World War II and the Cold War in a given year. They ended up with uh, 5,300 hires, which is not bad. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it was a combination of uh, you know, really smart um, work in terms of uh, you know, the trade schools, which are now you know, totally um, oversubscribed. Kids have figured out that that's actually a pathway to a, a real future. 
uh, comprehensive high schools are now offering their own sort of shop classes, career pathway classes that are connecting kids and getting hired right out of high school. The uh, Workforce Investment Act job training program, pre-apprenticeship programs, they trained 1,000 uh, welders, metal tradesmen last year in 2023 alone. And then there was recruitment um, uh, you know, all across the country. 86% retention, okay? So again, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, you hired those numbers, but people just flush out. 86% right. retention. And again, I think there's a couple of things that uh, I would add to, Ta to Don's list is number one, the Metal Trades Council, it's a, it's a union shipyard just negotiated a five-year contract, which is now taking the entry-level wa wages way out of the Chick-fil-A sort of category with a, with a real health plan and a pension uh, that's part of it. And I would also note that you know, the, the problem of student loan debt is really now, I think, having um, one healthy sort of impact, which is kids are basically looking at college now and going, wait a minute. You know? and, and I think that is really driving people to, in a much different direction. Um, just organically. Right. And, and so um, the target this year is another 5,200. They're on pace uh, in the first quarter to, to satisfy that. Uh, again, I think the post-COVID churn that was going on in the labor market has really stabilized. Now people are kind of figuring out you can't you know, just kind of pick right. and choose from one week to the next. You got to <laughs> actually make a choice. And I think it's really, it's showing really impressive results. That's great. Uh, it, one one follow up on that really quick. It, are they recruiting from uh, outside the local area? Absolutely. To get that many people, you got to. No, be, particularly the engineering uh, yeah. component. They're they're all over the country. Right. By the way, it's a more diverse workforce. Um, you know, more women welders who are, are really good, and um, and again, underrepresented minorities are really starting to show up. I mean, I've done the factory gates for almost twenty years, shaking hands out there. It's a different workforce, but I the quality is good. The the um, rickover. C trial score was the highest in the, in the Virginia class. I mean, this is almost a Gen Z, Gen X labor force now. It's yeah. the baby boomers have kind of moved on and they're doing really good work. You know, so speaking of an area where uh, Gen X and Gen, or I guess Gen Z and, and millennials have really come, come through is in Ukraine, right? So to pivot a little bit, you know, one of the things that's happening in Ukraine, you know, Congressman Jackson, is the use of you know, unmanned systems, drones, to really you know, mitigate shortfalls that they're having in traditional force structure, and, and even in the size of their force, because they're having their own difficulties uh, recruiting and retaining people. Um, you know, do, we, do we need to start thinking about adopting some of the approaches that the Ukrainian military has done, like, you know, to, to bring in more unmanned systems? to use more technology to make up for shortfalls in the, in the size and the, the shape of our, our traditional force? I think that's happening already right now. I, I, a perfect example of that is, uh, you know, recently we had the, uh, the, uh, the FAIR program that was uh, canceled uh, in, in lieu of uh, coming up with uh, something that's more uh, autonomous and attributable uh, and cheaper. Uh, and I think that if you go out and when I travel around and I go to, you know, to different commands and I talk to them about what they're doing, I think that universally, everywhere I go, the, the unmanned systems come, uh, come, uh, come out. I think everyone's doing that right now. I think whether it's uh, unmanned uh, surface uh, vessels, you know, that can, uh, uh, can go in a lot closer and get a lot deeper and, and are more undetectable than some of the bigger platforms we have. Uh, the, the aerial systems and a lot of the, uh, the surface systems are deploying the aerial systems uh, that can go out and uh, not only do the traditional ISR, but, uh, you know, uh, can also, uh, you know, uh, provide decoys and things of that nature and uh, provide a whole bunch of targets that the enemy then has to interpret which one's the real one and which one's the one that we want to protect. That we have that and un undersea in particular, I think that we have a huge advantage. In general, we have an advantage in, in undersea anyways, but I think that some of the uh, unmanned undersea systems that are coming out right now are, are really cutting edge. And I think that we're way ahead of our competitors in some of those areas. So I think that that, that is the future of, uh, of war fighting in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think it's just going to continue to grow. And I think it's a good thing. It, it, so um, you know, that you brought up undersea. So one thing I wanted to, to ask about is AUKUS. You know, so with the um, reduction in funding for uh, submarine construction in the current budget, you know, that starts to bring into question AUKUS Pillar 1 uh, and the commitment to that. Um, you know, so Congressman Courtney, you know, you're from that neck of the woods. So uh, one of the you know, questions is, uh, is the U.S. going to be willing to really take three submarines out of the operating inventory, right? Because we can't give them a broken boat. We have to give them one that's, that's in currently uh, operational condition. So we're going to take three of our operational submarines out. Um, you know, what could be an inventory of maybe 35, 36 you know, operating you know, submarines? Um, 
is that something that we're going to still be willing to do when the time comes? And, and how do we make it so that we're, we're more likely to do that when? when so we that? I think if you look at uh, last year's NDAA, which really encompassed all the authorities, right. uh, historic NDAA, in my opinion, in terms of um, authorizing the first sale of a nuclear submarine, we've never done that before. Uh, a lot of the technology transfer. And I know, I think we have some Australian friends here. The parliament just passed their defense export control bill a couple of weeks ago, which is going to allow them to create a fast lane to share technology as part of AUKUS. The British parliament is, in, in, is underway with their own effort in terms of uh, doing that. So if you look at the sale dates, it's 2032, 2035, 2038. And the fleet size in, in 2032 is 50. Because again, <clears throat> and this is why I, th I feel very strongly we need to reverse this budget's cut of that submarine that Rob referred to, um, because um, you know that was sort of the premise that we were all operating off of last November and December when we were conferencing the bill, and uh, you know the Navy might say, well, it's only one sub, but you know what, every sub counts, and so. Um, but again, if it's 50 in 2032, it's actually 54 mm -hmm. in 2035 and 58 in 2038. So, you know, I think everyone had a comfort level. And, and again, that was Admiral Houston came and testified before our committee in October and just was adamant that the force multiplier benefit right. of having Australia positioned in Perth to, you know, really help with the patrols and et cetera, um, you know, was why the Navy supported ACA. So um, again, I still believe that we need to fix this budget in terms of the Virginia program for the sake of our supply chain allies, whole host of other reasons. Um, but I, I think we can handle it. Right, right. It, so um, you know, one of the ways that we might increase the supply of operational submarines is uh, through improvements in uh, the maintenance uh, throughput you know, of the public shipyards and the in private yards that are increasingly brought, being brought into this. Um, you know, so Rep Representative Kiggins, you represent some of that area, um, and uh, this is clearly an, an area where the Navy's had difficulty, right? You've got Boise that's been uh, out of service for a few years now, and other submarines are backed up trying to get through. Uh, the Navy wants to refuel and, and you know, put through another uh, couple deployments, some Los Angeles-class submarines that are otherwise at the end of their service life. That's gonna require a lot of maintenance capacity to be brought to bear. Um, do we need to make more investment there? Does Congress need to step in and try to uh, shore, uh, shore up the private industrial base as well as what's happening with the public shipyards? Yeah, we're, we're gonna need all of our shipyards, so we need to be protective of all of those domestically. We may need, even need a few overseas eventually, but you know, especially domestically right now, they're hurting because we've reduced the size of our Navy, right? We don't have as many ships as, as we should have, so they're all kind of fighting for that same competition. And, uh, and whatever we can do to incentivize uh, in, you know, keeping their doors open, providing them again with that stable budget piece, I think so that, so that they know how much uh, money they will have uh, in the pipeline so that they don't have to reduce the size of, of their workforce. I know in Hampton Roads, the number of ships has gone from between 2014 to 2024 from 48 to, to 28. So that's, that's about a 30% reduction uh, in the number of ships. We've had to reduce our workforce because of that as well. So they can't keep firing people and then rehiring people. So that stability piece is very important. Making sure that the Navy is sticking to schedules. I know that there's a lot going on in the world again, and sometimes we do need to re you know, extend those deployment lengths. But, but as much as we can stick to the schedule, it allows for those maintenance schedules to, to be more solid and then for our ship repair, both civilian our, our pri private and public shipyards to uh, to be able to plan for that maintenance schedule. So, uh, there, but all of that investment, the continued investment we have in the infrastructure with upgrading some of our public shipyards. I know Norfolk Public Shipyard, uh, you, I think Rob Whitman is the one that he said that if you want to film a 1920s movie, you can just go over there. It's all set up for you already. You know, it looks just like it did in the 1920s. So. Uh, we can do better at that. There's a lot of quality of life issues we've looked into as well because yes, we want to we want to train and incentivize that workforce. We want to keep them as well. So, uh, so we've tried to work on on some Navy Exchange kiosks, improving their gyms, some of the the bowling out, you know, the little things, right? That the housing pieces that that, that we can work on to uh, to keep good people to be able to repair our ships. So, as a as a follow up there, so do we need to think about? Um, managing and contracting for private ship repair you know, differently than we have in the past. So we had MISMO for a while, multi-ship, multi-option, and now we've kind of now gone to MACMO where we sort of contract each availability individually. And you know, even we try to give the, the ship 
repair yards more time to be able to plan, but still I think it's difficult when you're a ship repair yard and you don't know from one you know, six month period to the next whether you're gonna get you know, more work or, or not and you've gotta manage your workforce. Do we need to think about the, a different model for how we invest in ship repair um, and, and how we do those contracts? So right now uh, EB is doing, as a private yard, uh, repair for the USS Hartford and they used a different approach. It was called Smart Start where again, they just um, had the design work ready, they had the parts ready, it was all sort of like in place when they began right. the work. They're 10 months ahead of schedule, yeah. okay? Not bad, I mean, right. you, you, it's hard to find a program that can actually say that with a straight face. So, um, and we should do it in the public yards, we should do it you know, all across the, the repair. I mean, Admiral Houston, uh, again, when he came over in October, talked about the fact, because I think it was like 60% um, of the fleet was actually available, right. which is a ridiculously <laughs> low number. It's up to 67 now, but the, um, but he said his goal is to get to 80%. And again, using different approaches. Right. And, and again, I think you know the Hartford is a good example of how you can actually do this. So, so Representative Kiggins, on the, on, the, on the conventional side, so the ship repair side, you know, working with the amphibious ships and the surface combatants, do we need to think about you know, a similar model where we start to kind of forward invest for future availabilities and get them to you know, stabilize their workforce and their, their supply chains before that availability is even contracted for? I mean, there's gotta be a different model. I that think might whatever stability we can give those guys to be able to plan to keep that, that workforce, that's one of the main complaints that I hear from the ship repair industry just locally is, uh, is their inability to, to, to maintain and, and keep that, that trained workforce. Uh, Cause they have that, they infrequently are using their, their own funding to keep them even when the work isn't there because right. they know the work hopefully will come. Uh, looking at the contract awarding, uh, the way we're, we're awarding contracts, making sure we're mindful of the small businesses. I know that we hear that complaint a lot from from the smaller ship repair industry uh, folks, but uh, but we need everybody in this fight, right? I want them all to be to be taken care of, to be well trained, to be ready to go. If God forbid we we needed them even more. Brian, if I could, <clears throat> she brings up a great point, but we also have to send the signals yeah. to the yards. First, you have the capacity that we're going to be there. Right. Included in the NDAA this year was the modified by American, which incrementally right. steps up what needs to be made in this country. But also equally, it provides for work in those other countries that want to work with us. Right. Have a two-way door, you treat us well, we'll treat you well. But when they know that this isn't just gonna be a one-year blimp that will increase it, they will increase that if they know that. But the other item is we're just talking about maintaining the ships we have. Right. <laughs> with no war, with no conflict going on. Right. Throw that equation into it. We're close to a panic mode if that happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and Brian, two two things uh, that are that are essential to this. We can talk about all the aspects of maintaining the industry, all the aspects of, you know, how do we make sure that we we model and we execute work properly. The bottom line is capacity and capability. Shipyard Improvement Operations Plan, we have yeah. to fully execute that. Right. You know, the, the, the proposal was 20 years. We don't have 20 years right. to do that. It has to be done in 10, which means you need private yards there because when you take down a dry dock, somebody else yeah. has got to do the work. So our private yards have to be able to step up. Secondly, is you cannot have a proposal that comes to the Congress that says we're gonna build six ships and retire 19. Listen, I'm not a mathematician, right. but I fail to figure out how you do addition by subtraction. And if we are going to retire ships, which, which by the way, in this proposal, we retire 15 plus years of expected service life. So we're retiring these ships early. Mm -hmm. So that even takes maintenance out of the game. Right. So if we're gonna sustain a maintenance industry and we're retiring ships early, what signal does that send? We need those ships. Right. We're gonna go from 297 down below, uh, somewhere around 284. I mean, come on, in the face of what we're facing, uh, those things can't happen either. So we have to make sure we get the other aspects right. But those elements, PSYOPs, let's, let's do that fast. Let's make sure Congress focuses on funding that so we can right. get that done. And then can't retire ships early. Right, right. Cousin Jackson. I would say also, it's not always a capacity issue either. I was out at the uh, NASCO uh, yard the other day, and obviously I was walking through some of the uh, uh, you know, some of their, you know, some of their areas, some of their uh, machine shops and, and whatnot, you know, and uh, obviously there was, there was very little going on in there. And so I started talking to them about it and they said, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, 
it's it's not a uh, capacity issue for them it's a demand issue and you know so i think that we have to figure out a way like with between the public yards and the private yards uh, to share some of the work for example like they pointed out to me obviously that you know some of the stuff that's going on uh, in the public yards uh, they don't have access to it because of you know the, the sensitive nature and you know uh, the, uh, the the systems that they're they're working but maybe some of these uh, these other like the potable water stuff or whatever you know stuff that's not part of the essential uh, system if, if they're behind on that work they could move that work over uh, to the uh, uh, you know to the to the private side and let them do it because they had the capacity uh, they just didn't have the demand and so I think that there has to be a better cooperation between all of the yards uh, to keep to keep things on track right but, uh, that's a good point so you know congressman Norcross so one one of the challenges that the Navy faces in you know trying to improve the sustainment of the fleet is funding right because operations and support funding is growing you know faster than you know even procurement funding as a, as a fraction of inflation uh, and it, it, going in the out years it actually will constrain the size and shape of the fleet you know if we try to if we don't do something about how much the fleet costs to maintain we're going to have challenges to even keeping the fleet that we have now uh, because it's just going to be too, become too expensive H how can you know Congress and and the the military work together to try to get those sustainment costs down to a manageable you know, level, um, is it stabilizing the demand signal and getting the infrastructure developed? Is that part of it? Yeah, I feel like John Garamendi's behind me, who <laughs> is on readiness to be answering it. So John, this one's for you. Uh, truth in sustainment costs, I would challenge most people to take a look at major acquisition programs across the services when we're going to buy a new product. And the cost of purchasing that, I don't want to say simple, but relatively straightforward. The cost of sustainment doesn't even come close. Yeah. It changes, and the fact of the matter is when you're trying to get uh, that program going, the sustainment cost is out there. Right. Right. So there needs to be truth in the sustainment, <laughs> and not suggesting there's anything that is not above board here, but we're just not focused on that. And when you start out with bad numbers, they only right. get worse. Uh, it's a real challenge. I, just to pivot for a moment, what Rob talked about the numbers, incredibly important, but very simple. Uh, CNO Admiral Clark back in the 80s said, you know, what he could buy 10 destroyers for in 2005, he couldn't buy one today. But they're 10 times capabilities right. and we have to take that into account right. it's just not hulls that's way too simple but it is a combination of both it is our capabilities and what we're able to do today far exceeds anything that was around 20 years ago right but it doesn't cover on the, the sheer numbers are important but they're not the only driver by any chance right right so, um, you know, one thing I wanted to make sure we talked about is naval aviation, because the Navy includes airplanes, uh, and the Marine Corps includes airplanes. Uh, and so, <laughs> sorry. So, the, <laughs> uh, so one of the things, um, you know, the Navy's really having difficulty with right now is, you know, the, the TAC air uh, shortfalls. So there's a, there's a TAC air shortfall right now. Um, the Navy already pushed out the FAXX program several more years. Um, there are some, thanks to Congress, some new Serpil Hornets being procured in this year's appropriations. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a clear path ahead for um, the carrier air wing. Um, and then for the rest of naval aviation, they just finished kind of a recapitalization cycle and have to look at you know, what's next after MH60s and P8s go out of service. Um, so Congressman Whitman, where, what do you, where do you see the, you know, the Navy needing to go in terms of sustaining the carrier air wings it already has, much less, you know, going forward. Well, it, it's going to be critical going forward. We know that there's a floor of 11 carriers. We know we need 11 carriers in order to sustain a surge force of five to six. The thing, the key is, though, you have to have aircraft. We have recently, finally, Boeing and the Navy came to an agreement on the final production of F-18. Uh, the challenge now is to make sure we get enough F-35s mm -hmm. in production to be able to sustain these 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 carrier uh, wings, and then to make sure too that the transition takes place to where as Super Hornets retire out, that you don't have this valley right. where now all of a sudden you have aircraft carriers sitting at the dock because there's no, no aircraft on board. That means we have to get those lines to intersect. That's, that's more of a challenge than what a lot of folks think because the tactical air component of that right. is about uh, maintaining production. Here's one of the things that really is a challenge right now, and that is, we need those aircraft to be able to perform 
at the technological standard that's there today, which is Technical Refresh 3. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure those aircraft have that TR3 upgrade on board. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we find ourselves again behind the curve in delivering that. Right. Now, Lockheed has said, oh, now it's going to be Q3. Uh -huh. I mean, there needs to be an all hands on deck mentality to go, no, that's not acceptable. We need these aircraft. And now we're going to have hundreds of aircraft sitting on the tarmac waiting to get a software upgrade. Right. When those aircraft are needed in all the different branches, whether it's the Marine Corps variant, the Air Force variant, or the Navy variant. I mean, goodness knows, there's a, there's a, there's a, I want to make sure I'm saying something. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm saying something very productive here. I, I want to make sure that be everybody, exactly, be positive. Everybody understands the urgency that's there, that this needs to get done, right. and that these aircraft need to be delivered. And the problem is, is hiccups with TR3 are going to perturbate into other areas, Block 4 and others. So we're, we're going to need those aircraft. Listen, we are all in. F20, F F35 is the way forward. So we don't have another choice. But we have these software upgrades to deal with. We have an engine issue that, that we have to deal with. What are we going to do with that? How do we make sure that the engine uh, right. goes through its, its expected service life? All those things are right there before us. We have to do better at developing software. Today, as we speak, the methodology used to modernize the software platform that aircraft is literally in the age of smoke signals. <laughs> and, and listen, we do digital twin, we do this development in all these other lines, and yet here we're, uh, you know, we're putting a thumb drive in an aircraft going up and flying and taking it, running back to the lab and go, oh, now, now let's figure it out. Right. I'm like, really? Come, come on now, it's like running out there with a jar and gathering smoke and running back to the lab and go, let's figure out what's in the smoke. I mean, we have got to do better. And this is an all hands on deck moment. I mean, this is key, this, we're all in. F-35 is it. Right. That's all we have. Right. Let's get our fannies in gear and get this thing going and get it on the decks of the aircraft carrier, get it in the hands of our, of our pilots in the Air Force, get our fannies in gear. I mean, this is it. I hate to, I hate to get fired up about it, right. but I'm fired up about it because this is the future of tactical air for this nation. Get our fannies in gear. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. I mean, I think that we have to come to the realization that F-35 is it you know, yeah. for the Navy. There isn't like an alternative. And I this think for it. a while we thought there was one. Um, yeah, and just to tickets. piggyback off of Rob's yeah. passion uh, and, and spreading that that F-35 capability across the country, right? We've got them right now in, in Lemoore, and I know the fight is often focused on the West Coast, but but I represent the East Coast and the Master Jet Base, NAS Oceana there, and we need F-35s there as well. So I, I don't want to wait till. Right. Uh, FAXX and and right. all that you know I want I want it now because we also know that the money follows the new toys and, and we need some some improved infrastructure out there as well. We also have some old toys, old aircraft that we need to take care of. The F-22, for example, right. in the Air Force, great fighting platform. I've got those close to my district as well at Langley, and uh, and we need to take care of those. You know, I, I wish we had more. Here we are. We know that the F-35 is is the next best thing, but we still have some older aircraft out there that. We need to find ways that we can keep those things in the air from the, the parts you know, production line uh, to just the maintenance side. How are, we, how are we taking care of the ones we have? So there's some work to do, but I agree with Rob as far as holding, holding your feet, the, the, the Lockheed Martins of the world, you know, their feet to the fire, making sure that they get off the tarmac at the production facility and into the hands of the warfighter so that those guys can get trained up. I know that the F-18 guys over at NAS Oceana talk to me very frequently about they're having to change their tactics on almost a weekly basis to keep up with the Chinese. So what can we do to make sure those guys are getting the technology they need in their cockpits as soon as possible? Right, which brings up a great point about you know, software. And one of the questions that we got from the group or from the crowd here was about software. Um, you know, and, and the you know, military, obviously software is increasingly where military capability <coughs> resides on, on yeah. these new systems. And TR3 is a great example of how yeah. software can yeah. make or break a, a platform. Um, so does the, how, how does the DOD need to change its approach to buying software? Because we've, you know, Congress has given them new authorities, you know, the software appropriation, the software acquisition pathway. Um, they're not being really fully utilized uh, by the services. Um, we, where do we need to go with regard to software acquisition? Well, Brian, the whole paradigm within the Pentagon needs to change. And listen, from its very inception, the Pentagon has been a hardware-centric organization. Hardware, hardware, hardware. And software has kind of been uh, an afterthought. Let, let's, let's figure out the software after all. Let's get the hardware right. It needs to be the opposite right. now. Software needs to inform the hardware because what we find today is that software is so dynamic 
and the environment we exist in is so dynamic, you have to be able to change the software r literally in real time. If you're going to be operating at the speed of relevance, you have to have software that is upgradable. You have to have software that you can integrate changes into quickly. And then you build the hardware around that. The easier part now is going to be the hardware. So I think we have to change the whole mindset there. And then another, another thing too is, is that the Pentagon is somewhat hesitant because they don't know how to acquire software. Right. Because software is a dynamic acquisition. It's not like saying, here's the requirement, let's buy a hundred of these, we know what we right. got, and we're going to consistently yeah. put this across the production line. No, software is a dynamic acquisition. Right. So let's figure out how we acquire software, how we make sure that it's constantly upgradable. How do we make sure, too, we have the best software engineers working in that realm to give us the full capability? Because I can tell you, our adversaries are right there at the forefront of what they're seeing software do. And this is at the dawn of the age of artificial intelligence. So we have to be better at what we do with the data that we get because our platforms bring in a ton of data right. and we don't use but a, but, a, but a microscopic part of that. Right. We have to do better at using the data that we have. We have to do better in the software that's upgraded to use that data. And then we have to do better too in being able to now incorporate artificial right. intelligence. In order to prevail in a very dynamic environment, those three things have to happen. So, I mean, there's actually been movement, though, and I, mean, I couldn't agree with more with what Rob described. But having said that, I mean, if you look at um, the B21 um, yeah. program, yeah. I mean, Secretary Kendall, back right. in his prior, yeah. you know, uh, iteration, I mean, he that was a key component in the contract negotiations, which is that the government owns it. I mean, and, you know, the, the story of the F-35 where the government doesn't own it, yeah. I think is really something that the GAO has been pounding us yeah. on an annual, sometimes multi-year, you know, <laughs> multi-times a year basis about the fact that that's really haunting that program in terms of sustainment costs. The, the recent contract the Army let for, um, for uh, FLARA, you know, yeah. I mean, again, the software component was a critical you know, basically yeah. decision maker in terms of who won that contract. So, I mean, I do think that it is starting to penetrate yeah. the, the Pentagon's, you know, awareness that, you know, this this really is, as you pointed out, you know, that's that's almost like it's a computer with, you know, that <laughs> right. we're buying with <laughs> right. everything else sort of just as kind of secondary. Right, digital design. Right. right. Yeah. In another area, oh, sorry. Who owns the rights? Right. Oh, this good point. This is across yeah. the board. Yeah. That challenge now for those new platforms that we'll see in the future, it's clear because we've gone into the program. But the F-35 is a great example, something we started 20 years ago and what we're doing there versus next generation, completely right. different. Right. And we have to go through that transition and it's a real challenge yeah. because that's part of the pricing model of the old way of doing things. and. We are today still challenged by that. Yeah, yeah, it's almost we can't get our own way when it comes to the contracting you know, mechanisms we put in place uh, when we started a program like that. That's where you need good lawyers, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I, to, to build on that, Don's exactly right. You know, we, we need to look at the lessons that we've learned from things like B21, digital design, uh, flora, all great lessons learned. The key is, though, the reality before us is now we have, we have to make F35 work regardless of how we got here. Now that we're here, we have to, to take the lessons learned and we ought to know better to be able to do things quicker and faster and make F-35 operational with new up-to-date software. So, so uh, an area where you know, the, the Navy in particular has done a lot of you know, kind of rapid turn, agile uh, innovation is in, in special forces uh, and in special operations. Um, you know, Congressman Jackson, you spent some time with the uh, SEALs and with the special operations forces. We're seeing in Ukraine how uh, they've really relied on their special operators to take on the bulk of you know, what their Navy is doing, right? So their Navy is largely unmanned and it's largely being operated by special operators. Um, so do we need to think about, you know, as we move, as we kind of move away from the, the special operations community focusing mostly on counterterrorism and mostly in the Middle East and North Africa region to you know kind of pivot to what they're going to do in the you know Indo Pacific. Uh, do we need to think about some of those models of using them as your kind of you know frontline innovation force, employing unmanned systems, and, and doing things like we're seeing in Ukraine, or is there a different model? Well, absolutely, I think we do, and, and there's a lot of challenges there. To be honest with you, and, and one of the bigger challenges right now is that you know the general consensus across a lot of different communities, including special operations, is that uh, you know that we are we're moving from the global war on terror uh, to the Indo-Pacific and the potential conflict there. I get that, but the issue is, I promise you, that the global and terror is not going away. Uh, there's still going to be a big need for that. That's not going to, uh, it's just going to be additional requirements on our special operators. 
the same time, some of the stuff that we've done, uh, you know, recently with the withdrawal in Afghanistan and, you know, pulling uh, a lot of our resources and stuff out of the Middle East and Africa, uh, that has a big impact on these forces as well because they rely on all of those resources being in place to be able to fall in on some of those yeah. existing resources and do their job. And those resources aren't there anymore. So I think that we have to start looking in, in, in innovative ways to replace those things. You know, whatever it was, whether it was ISR, it was air support, it was a QRF or whatever those resources uh, supplied, they're, not, they're no longer are there. So these guys are more than ever out all by themselves on their own. Now, I, I, it, the one thing that disturbs me is like in the Army, they're cutting 3,000 to 5,000 special operators, right? <laughs> yeah. The Navy hasn't done that yet. I hope we don't go down that path. I don't think we will. But, you know, one service a lot of times follow the other service. We can't do that at, at, this, at this particular time right now. Uh, and it, it's just, uh, you know, uh, the reason is because, you know, they're involved in so much. I mean, uh, they're, they're fighting all fronts. They're keeping us in the fight in a lot of places, obviously. I mean, I go back to the example that we probably, you know, would have had all kinds of issues, may not even be in the Philippines right now, had it not been for special operations keeping that door open during some difficult political times so that we can continue to operate there, right? So we, we've got to figure out how to support this. Uh, you know, the Navy is in a unique position right now. The Navy Special Forces can do certain things that the other Special Forces can't do that are relative to Indo-Pacific, but we can't lose sight that we still have a big responsibility with regards to the war on, uh, to the war on terror, and that's going to continue to be a problem. Yeah, good point. <clears throat> Good point. Yeah, so uh, a question from the uh, audience, uh, which is a, you know, obviously a, kind of an elephant in the room, is the 45-day review that was recently completed by the Navy on its shipbuilding programs. Uh, Congressman Courtney, you're the ranking member on the, the Sea Power and Protection Forces uh, subcommittee. Um, you know, what, do you, what do you think of the, I mean, the Navy's so, being transparent. So the, the premise that um, when the Secretary requested this report was to find out what the impact of COVID was on shipbuilding. Totally valid question. Uh, we, we obviously had this external event that you know affected all of manufacturing in the U.S., civilian and, and defense. Um, what we got back was um, something that actually I think we sort of already knew, which is that all the programs were slowed down because of it. And, and you know, uh, there's a variety of reasons in terms of just uh, supply chain problems that cropped up. Uh, the fact that you know social distancing in shipyards is really hard, and they didn't even have PPE initially, and that slowed things down. Uh, the retirement of older workers, uh, I think, definitely was in bigger numbers than I think people had, you know, projections, you know, pre-COVID. That's there. So, um, you know, so again, I don't think there was anything in that report that was really that, you know, revealing in terms of just, you know, we all sort of knew that. Okay, the real question is sort of what's the what's the the plan, and, you know, the. The budget speaks more powerfully than anything else, right? I mean, it's uh, that's that's what sends the real demand signal. And cutting back procurement as a solution, uh, in my opinion, is just really uh, either overthinking or you know really misinterpreting, right. you know what what actually happened uh, uh, during COVID. Um, you know, the the Navy came over and talked about the fact. Well, now there's a big backlog in in uh, Virginia 16. Well, in the next nine months. We're going to deliver New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Iowa. Mm -hmm. So you're going to basically, in nine months' time, have that right. backlog cut, um, really without doing yeah. anything. Right. You know, right. and and um, you know, as one supply chain um, vendor who I was visiting during the Easter break said to me, you know, you don't get to two per year by funding only one per year because that that just sends this signal, particularly in the submarine industrial base, which has been, you know, sort of the the poster child for procurement instability going back 30 years. And um, you, know, you start with the Ohio program, Los Angeles program, the delay to start at Virginia. Um, you know, th th these sort of start-stop um, signals is why we had an industrial base erode. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the investments that are going into the submarine industrial base that it were in the last couple of budgets, great. Mm -hmm. I mean, love it. Right. Uh, in fact, our uh, committee sort of plus this up back as far as 2018, Jim Langevin, our colleague, you know, was a big proponent of that. But as again, another one of the supply chain guys said, you know, the SIB money does not pay the bills. Right. What pays the bills is, is orders and procurement. And when you start to see that sort of fluctuate again, given really the experience that these folks have lived through, then suddenly it's like, okay, we're gonna you know, hold back, whether it's hiring, you know, uh, more purchase of equipment uh, or buildings. And, 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 and again, the SIB is a great effort, particularly where it's in the public yards there, but that is not a substitute. If right. you're a businessman or woman in terms of trying to project, you know, is this a program I can really invest money in? Right, right.
Yeah, yeah listen, it, it really is about demand signal. And, and you, can't, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, the, the reason we're reducing the submarine request is because we don't think the industrial base can do it. That's wrong. Uh, the industrial base can do it if you send them the demand signal. We're at about 1.6, I think, submarines today uh, annually. We need to be at 2.3. Right. The way we get there is to send the proper demand signal. And just as Joe said, it has to be consistent year after year after year. The industry's shown that they can spin up to do this. You look at the hiring there at Electric Boat. You look at what the submarine industrial base can do. If we properly fund the submarine industrial base, which by the way, too, is what the Australians are looking to do. Listen, we have a great opportunity here. But, but, you, but you can't back away and not expect it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you say, well, we're only going to buy one uh, because we don't think the industry can do it, then, then you end up in a really bad place. We have to send the demand signal. And when we do, the industry's shown that they can, they can get there. Yeah, so, so Congressman Norcross and Congressman uh, Kagans, you both have a lot of suppliers you know, in your districts as well as you know, uh, Navy facilities. Um, are, are the suppliers that you talk to, are they looking for like a direct investment from the government in, in improving the industrial base, like grants to them to you know, improve their production capacity? Or are they looking for just give me more orders to the prime and, and I'll, you know, it'll flow to me eventually? So grants, they're called contracts. Yeah. <laughs> Send me the signal that we need these, these submarine bases, just one great example. We know we're going to be building those from years to years to come. But the other issue is competition within the supplier base. Um, when you are a single source, uh, yeah. we need to take that into consideration when we build up programs and cancel programs. What happens to that capacity and that capability here? But I think what is extremely important is that we send the signal call to contract, and that comes right. primarily from the prime contractor. So they had a lot to do with it. During the pandemic, we did infuse them with right. cash. But we're past that now, and I think it's time that industry, and I think they are uh, picking up those signals, and they're going to be there. But it's literally program by program where this comes into account. I think they're looking for a steady signal too, right? So that's yeah. predictable for them, so that they know kind of what 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 to expect in the future. And when we send them budgets that are decommissioning more ships than we're building, and we are cutting our Virginia class sub build in half, and we're slowing that aircraft carrier build when they're expecting to be able to do two at once, I think that's the wrong signal to be sending to them. We need to be saying that we're going to be plussing up the size of our Navy. We understand that we're behind compared to China. We're going to keep up our, our sub programs so that we can participate, you know, as we promised with AUKUS. Mm -hmm. We're going to build more aircraft carriers because that is the number one tip of the spear war fighting machine that we can send anywhere in the world. So there's some clear signals that I think need to be sent, uh, you know, from the administration level on down to the rest of the defense industrial base so that so that they can prepare for for the needs ahead. Right. So one last question to everybody um, as we move into this, you know, we're getting ready to have you know, congressional hearings over the uh, budget over the next few weeks. Um, and then we've got appropriations and authorizations and everything. Uh, so what do you think the appetite is going to be uh, on the Hill for either uh, increasing uh, defense appropriations above the FRA right. limits uh, for this year, and then you know going into next year as we as we start to look to the fiscal year, you know 25 or 26 budget even, um, you know the appetite there. Well, listen, the, the FRA number is going to inform what we do with uh, with NDAA with the authorization. Uh, it'll be up to the appropriators as to whether or not they see a gap there that needs a supplemental. And, re and we remember back through the Budget Control Act of 2011, the supplementals were the way to, for us to yeah. close the gap. I think the environment, though, today to be able to get a supplemental through is, is more of a challenge unless you can show a direct need today right. and where the threat is and how you, how you need to invest. But I, I think that's the only mechanism right. going forward. And it may be specific to things like submarine or the submarine industrial base, mm -hmm. things that we know that we need that we have to ramp up. As, as Joe said, that's a big delta to close to add back in a submarine. Mm -hmm. So all those questions, I think, will be part of that. So, I mean, we went through this uh, with sequestration year in and year out where um, Congress actually sort of the, you know, right. the world got a vote and, you know, the reality of, of uh, the sequestration spending levels, you know, just had to kind of yield, you know, to that reality. So, um, uh, again, I think the markup, is, as Rob said, you know, we're, we're going to be, I think, using the FRA top line for, for now. But I just think that, um, you know, when, when you just sort of see how, you know, sort of the the, the, what's happening out there is just really going to, I think, you know, force um, a, a change at some point. And again, it'll probably be after the election. Right. 
Yeah, good point. How so certainly, Ranking Member Smith likes to say spending more is one thing, but spending it better is the ultimate goal. You hear some of the numbers that come out personnel jumping plus 5%. These are all huge costs. The subs, the carriers, Sentinel, B21, Space. These are all plus ups that people are talking about, yet we are bound by some of the conditions that were laid out in the budget deal. Uh, I think if Hass ran the world, it'd be a very different story, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we have to <laughs> operate with the rest of the members of Congress, and that is going to be a debate, and a fierce debate that we're going to have. Right, right. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk in Congress about cut, cutting spending in the economy and whatnot, but when it comes to, to defense and looking at, again, the, what's going on on the world stage right now, uh, then we start to talk about other ways we, we can fill those gaps, and supplementals are one way, and there's a lot of supplementals that are being talked about right now, from Ukraine to Israel to Southeast Asia, but if that's the vehicle that we need to use to, to be able to complete the mission, then that's the vehicle we need to use, and, and we need to make sure that you know the onus is on us who understand the fight that we're in uh, from the Armed Services Committee perspective to be able to communicate that to our other more you know, maybe or less passionate members of Congress, uh, you know, about the defense appropriations, because uh, I, I just, again, I, I the, my first comment was Congress needs to put our money where our mouth is. We do a lot of talk about the role of the Navy, the importance of, of our maintaining, a, to, you know, being a world superpower, but that comes with a cost. And so that's, that's our job here in Congress is to appropriate uh, that money, and we need to get that job done. I think, uh, you know, I think people see the threat out there uh, across the across the board on both sides of the aisle and in, in the House, at least. Uh, one of the one of the uh, great things about being on the Armed Services Committee was mentioned earlier that it is pretty bipartisan. We do come together on stuff. And I think that applies to the Congress in general. I think that there is an appetite uh, when the time comes uh, for supplementals to, to fill the gap uh, when it comes to our national defense. I think that there will be there'll be enough votes uh, across. Uh, there'll be there'll be people on the, uh, on the on the far right and on the far left uh, that won't. But we have enough people in the center. Uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle, that I think that we'll do uh, we'll do what's necessary to make sure that the that the, the funding is there. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to you know thank our, our panelists, uh, uh, Congressman Rod Whitman, Congressman Joe Courtney, Congressman Donald Norcross, Congresswoman Jen Kiggins, uh, and Congressman um, Ronnie Jackson uh, for being here today. I want to thank you all uh, for attending as well, and let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day.